Welcome to EJB Talks, Rutgers Blaustein School Experts in Policy, Planning, and Health, where we talk with our faculty and staff experts, as well as students, about how the fields of public policy, urban planning, public health, health administration, and public and urban informatics affect your lives. Welcome to another episode of EJB Talks. I'm Stuart Shapiro, the Associate Dean of the Faculty at the Blaustein School, and the purpose of this podcast is to talk with my colleagues, and today an alumni, about issues affecting people in New Jersey, the United States, and the world. Today we're talking with Brandon McCoy, the President of New Jersey Policy Perspective, and we are very proud to say a Blaustein School graduate. Brandon, welcome. Thank you, Professor. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. It's good to have you on. Can you tell us a little bit about New Jersey Policy Perspective and what you do? Absolutely. Um, so NJPP is a what we call a think and do tank, or as some of our partners say, a research and action uh, organization. Uh, we do a lot of sort of research and analysis, uh, particularly in four issue areas, tax and budget policy, health care, immigration, and economic security policy. Uh, occasionally we touch on other areas, but we have um, the view that New Jersey state budget is a moral document that should uh, provide for every resident in the state and ensure everybody has the resources they need to thrive. And so that's the uh, view that we bring to our work. We take very seriously issues of equity and discrimination to ensure that we are accounting for the uh, disparities of the past and the disparities that still live with us today. Um, but as I like to tell folks, you know, we just do math and um, <laughs> then we, we, we like to make sure that people understand exactly what our research means. So that's, that's the do part. Wonderful. And in terms of, I mean, we've talked a lot about disparities and equity on, on previous episodes of the podcast. And in terms of economic security, we're now in the midst of an economic crisis, unlike any since the Great Depression. Yep. Um, let's talk about short-term measures first, and then we'll go to medium and longer term. Um, you are on Governor Murphy's Commission for Reopening the Economy. Can you talk a little bit about your views on when we can reopen? It's obviously something that's on a lot of people's minds right now. Yeah, and it's, you know, um, as someone who is going on, I think, week 10 of being inside my house, um, I definitely yeah. understand folks uh, getting antsy and wanting to go outside. But as you know, Governor Murphy has said before, uh, before uh, data determine states. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we think about when, it's really uh, taking into account and being careful to consider what are the logistics necessary to ensure that not only can people get to work, but that all the other things in their lives um, are not going to be a, a major concern causing anxiety. So for me, you know, obviously testing and tracing and isolating uh, the coronavirus is going to be critical uh, before we can fully get back to a, a quote unquote reopened economy. But uh, there's a lot of other things that must be considered as well, like, you know, child care. Yeah. Uh, no one's coming back to work if their kids can't, if they, if they can't be sure that their children are safe and secure throughout the day. Um, we got to think about um, who are we asking to go back to work and when and how. Uh, you know, just to sort of blanket, let's reopen and get things back going. Uh, that's not really how it works in practice. And so uh, when I think about when, it's a little bit tough to, to, to see uh, or to pick a specific date. But I think what we can do right now is focus on the how and what people need to be whole before we can just expect them to go back to what they were doing before. Right. I, I, I think that we're learning that opening is a lot more complicated than closing. Yep. Um, it's, uh, and as you know, the how is really important, uh, just as important as when we reopen is how we reopen. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what considerations are you and the commission and the governor thinking about in deciding what opens first? I saw today that we got bike shops and, and car dealerships were allowed to mm -hmm. open. Uh, what, what, what's the process that that's go, people are going through in making those decisions? Well, um, definitely we're trying to figure out ways that folks can start operating again in a safe manner. So, you know, are there certain businesses um, and establishments that could maybe operate outside, you know, maybe have um, things outside of their facility 
because we know that you know the virus, uh, there's less likely chance for it to be transmitted to others uh, outside than it is inside. So you know, where can we have folks open up outside? Can certain restaurants operate outside instead? You know, can certain real real retail stores operate outside for the for the time being, or at least, or at least con- conduct their business? You know, outside uh, for folks that can do that, I think they'll probably you know be earlier in the queue uh, mm-hmm. for getting back to uh, back to uh, operation quickly. I think the tough thing is going to be there's a lot of portions of the economy and businesses that require intimate space, right? right. Uh, barbers. Um, you know, hairdressers, nail salons, um, massage therapists, just things that require, you know, physical touch and, right. and being near others. And, you know, I've seen a couple of videos on Instagram and elsewhere of like barbers sort of almost using, taking like a broomstick and attaching it to a clipper and like shaving <laughs> somebody's head like that. And I'm more than anything, I'm shocked at their skill of being able to do that. Um, right, so right, away. right. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, being, the, the biggest challenge here is just that we, we we've learned a lot about the virus, but there's still clearly so much we don't know. Right. Um, it's still acting in ways that it did not when it first came onto the scene. And so there's a bit of a concern about assuming that we know too much and that we can say, okay, you're good to go. You can open, you know, just follow these rules and all will be well. Um, but we have to try to make those decisions as we go along here. So I think folks who can be outside, um, operate outside will be, will be better off in the, in the early term here. Mm-hmm. Um, but folks who require intimate distance and stuff like that, uh, it's going to be critical that we figure out what are the specific guidelines that they need to follow as best as we know. And then, you know, for me, the thing that's always a big challenge is how do we enforce those guidelines? You know, we, right. we can pass, you know, laws and, and uh, policies all day long. But if state government or county government or local doesn't have the wherewithal, the capacity to make sure that people are following those things, then they're not worth the paper that they're written on. Right. You mentioned the schools earlier, and that mm-hmm. strikes me as, as kind of the hard, almost the hardest problem here. You've got an inside environment. You've got lots of people crowded together. And yep. those people are ones, as anyone who's tried to raise a child knows, ones are not particularly good at following rules. <laughs> and so, um, you know, getting the schools online requ- is required to get everything else online, but it's also one of the hardest things to, to bring up, I think. Absolutely. And, you know, we're heading into summer, so summer camps are going to be a thing. And, right. you know, like you said, I don't think we can expect kids to socially distance, really. That's not exactly how they operate. Exactly. Uh, um, and, you know, nor, nor should we expect them to. Uh, so this is really a big challenge, and I think it's the type of thing that, you know, uh, even though I'm the president of a policy think tank, I'm, my degree at Blaustein was actually a planning degree. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's given me a bit of a different view on some of these issues. Um, but it's it's the type of challenge that a lot of us who went into this line of work, uh, I don't think a lot of us thought we would be dealing with this type of thing. So it really requires us thinking outside the box and being willing to be a little bit bolder uh, yeah. than we've been called to be. Um, yeah, the planning uh, idea, you know, and the number of people I've seen say on social media, we just want to plan. And I don't think they realize how much uncertainty we're operating under and how difficult yeah. it is to come up with a plan. Um, it's more like figuring out what's the next step and what, what can we do next here. Yep, yep. Um, what is New Jersey doing to uh, cushion the blow the, of this economic crisis on those who have lost their jobs, have been furloughed, and what else should they be doing? So uh, thanks to some of the provisions in the CARES Act that uh, was signed into law um, at the end of March, uh, the state has been able to take advantage of up to an extra $600 a week in unemployment insurance coverage for individuals who are, you know, filing and and claiming unemployment. Um, And that's one of the scariest charts you could see right now is just the number of unemployment claims and how it just totally dwarfs the Great Recession and anything that we've seen before it, it really puts into, you know, into uh, focus how drastic and how rapid, you know, or rather quickly moving this crisis is. And so um, an extra $600 a week is really great. Um, mm-hmm. I think one concern I have about that is it is obviously because it's an unemployment insurance claim, it's tied to people who were working. Right. Um, and we have a lot of people in the state who don't and or cannot work. Um, so making sure, I think one thing that's left out is, uh, how do we uh, 
implement policies and have a more robust safety net that takes into account everybody regardless of their ability uh, to, you know, produce labor or, or have have employment. Um, but the, the $600 from an unemployment insurance has been a big boost. Um, but one of the major challenges is that, and, and the state has done a lot with regards to, um, you know, provided small business uh, support and relief through the EDA. The mm-hmm. son um, is, is talking about trying to figure out um, a fund for uh, undocumented immigrants who've been left out of federal relief packages, unfortunately. And undocumented immigrants are a major and important part of New Jersey's uh, culture and economy and society. So we got to figure that out. But the, the overarching challenge here is just that, you know, we're seeing a lot of states that have the financial and uh, fiscal resources to be flexible in their response. New Jersey has not really budgeted in the most forward-looking manner for the past right. decade or so. Um, you could actually probably argue for the past three decades. Uh, yeah, I was going to go back farther than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this, you know, I was trying to be nice, but it's been, it's been a while since we've had a really um, what I would consider a quality budget. I think this administration has done a much better job of investing in the assets that we need to grow our economy, but still you can't make up for almost 30 years of poor decision-making in two years. And so we, you know, states have what they call a rainy day fund to keep on hand for when a rainy day comes around. This is definitely a monsoon. Um, and New Jersey totally exhausted our rainy day fund from the Great Recession. And we didn't put more money into it until last year's budget. Governor Murphy and the legislature invested $401 million into it. Well, $401 million in New Jersey gets you four days of government operation. And <laughs> the recommendation from experts is two months. Wow. And so we just don't have the fiscal wherewithal right now. And, you know, our, our poor credit rating is infamous for a lot of other poor decisions that we've made. So our ability to borrow isn't as great as you'd like it to be, even though interest rates, interest rates are low. But all I say all that to say that because of the past decisions that we've made coming into this crisis, we are working with fewer resources and fewer assets to tackle it. And this is the most difficult crisis we've had. This is a more difficult crisis than the Great Recession, than the late 2000s um, recession. I'm sorry, the, um, the, the early 2000s recession and the early 1990s recession. This is the hardest one. And yet we have the fewest resources on hand to tackle it. And so that that's the major issue we're dealing with right now. And we just need to do a much better job of accounting for um, unanticipated crises like this. Like, and like, you know, I like to remind people we're six months away from hurricane season. We got to account for that too, you know? And so there's always going to be a crisis, but New Jersey hasn't done a very good job historically of budgeting, budgeting in a manner where we have the resources to handle it well. Right. And, so normally in a situation like this that New Jersey is in right now, we would think, okay, can the federal government help us? And indeed, the, as you mentioned, the CARES Act, remarkable accomplishment. You know, it's not every day you see trillion dollar legislation passed with the, the speed yeah. that it was passed in Congress. Um, but it's also becoming clear that it was not enough. Um, yep. The next step, uh, at least from the Democrats' point of view, uh, is the bill passed by the House last week, the HEROES Act. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and what it has that might be able to help us? Yeah, so right now, um, you know, it's it's only past the House. And so once right. the Senate gets done with it, it might look really, really different. Yep, um, very different. Yeah, but for now, at least, you know, the HEROES Act, um, it, it, it contains significant fiscal aid for states and local governments. Um, I believe the last time I looked, it had $900 billion. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think $500 billion would go to states and 375 to local governments. And then you have, uh, thankfully, an extra $40 billion for like Native American tribes and territories, which often have been left out of previous um, efforts. So that's good to see. Um, and that's really meant to help states avoid drastic cuts to programs and services. And Governor Murphy has stated that New Jersey is going to need between 20 and $30 billion in federal support to avoid drastic cuts here. Um, you know, the treasurer said that for this this year's budget, they anticipate a $10 billion shortfall. Um, that's wow. more than a quarter of our state budget. <laughs> and so that's really, really drastic. Um, and we're, and we're going to need that state relief if we're going to have any chance of, of, of coming out on the other side of this um, in, in, a, in a strong fashion. Um, there's also in the care, in the HEROES Act, rather, um, I think they're, they're considering a second round of direct payments to citizens. So it would be 
um, I believe $1,200 this time per family member, including children. Last time it was like $500 for children. This time it'll be $1,200 for children too, mm -hmm. up to $6,000 per household, which is good to see. Um, though I would argue that that should be tied to economic conditions and should be a consistent thing, not just something that we have to ask Congress to do over and over and over again. You really want it to be there as long as this crisis um, and this economic situation is with us. Um, there's also some labor protections. Um, there's something called the Heroes Fund that they, they, they would put $200 billion towards to provide hazard pay for essential workers, which is good to see. Um, also, the, the $600 per week in unemployment insurance. I mentioned before previously, it, um, or up until now, it was, it's, it's designed to end uh, at the end of July this year, but in the HEROES Act, it would be extended through January, 2021. Um, mm -hmm. So that'll be important. And then there's some other things. There's, um, I think $175 billion for housing assistance for folks to help, help low-income homeowners and renters afford housing costs. Uh, there's $100 billion for um, education to states and school districts and universities to defray additional pandemic-related costs. Uh, there's some more things in there, but, you know, that's a lot. And like you said, it's still not enough. Um, it's just right. what we're seeing, you know, like, like I mentioned child care before. This bill doesn't touch child care. Right. And it would take a significant, it would take billions of dollars a month for the federal government to stand up child care in the way that it needs to be. And so this is really causing us to rethink how we invest in and support all the things that it takes to run our country. Um, and I think we're finding out that things cost a lot more than we've been led to understand. Uh, mm -hmm. There's there's some folks who have known this forever, <laughs> um, uh -huh. you know, uh, but there's a lot of folks who like to sort of downplay the importance of investing in these things. And we're we're really learning that lesson right now. So uh, Senator Everett Dirksen famously said, a billion here, a billion there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money. Um, <laughs> what is your response when we're talking multiple trillions of dollars here to people who say we can't afford all of this? Yeah, and that's something that I hear a lot. Um, and I think it's a very narrow view of costs. Uh, there are costs on both sides of the ledger. There's cost right. to doing things and there's cost to not doing things. And we don't really very often cost, talk about the cost of not doing things. You know, what is the cost of having so many people who are sick and ill? What is the cost of having so many people who are undereducated or underemployed? You know, what's the cost of having so many folks um, who don't have access to critical services um, or who are living in an environment that is, you know, not entirely healthy either because of you know, um, lead in the water or in the ground or whatever it may be. Um, there's cost to those things. And I think the problem is that the way that, you know, we in this country have viewed costs have just been, well, how much does it cost to do it? And there hasn't been a ton of research or at least not enough attention paid to the research about the cost of not doing it. And so I, I would strongly say that the cost of not doing a lot of these things is way, way, way more and the cost of doing them. And the cost is only going to go up. I remember when I was actually at Blouse team, uh, I believe it was my second semester, and uh, Governor Christie at the time canceled the arc tunnel. And I was in the, um, the computer lab, and I just happened to be sitting with a bunch of transportation planners, and it was as if the world ended. Right? And they, they were just like, oh, my God, all of our projections are off. We're, we, we don't know what we're going to do. And the rationale at the time was, oh, well, you know, New Jersey's going is, is footing too much of the bill. It's going to cost too much. Well, now you look at the cost of doing it, it's way more than it was then. Right. And it's no less needed. It's more needed now. And if we, have that, if we had that tunnel in place now, we'd be a heck of a lot better off. And so just this conversation around costs, you know, I think it always um, obscures the costs that fall on marginalized communities, communities of color, people who've been pushed behind uh, throughout history. And I think that is a very incomplete and narrow view if we're going to be um, better about taking into account everybody who lives in this country. Right. I like your formulation of the cost of not doing things. Um, let me conclude with a question on the, on the sort of even longer run implications of the crisis we're going through. Um, and 
you mentioned already, you know, investing in a rainy day fund and, and investments. Is there anything else you'd like to add um, in terms of structural policy changes that you would like to see government, whether at the federal or state level, put a high priority on? Yeah, federal level, um, as wild as it is, I, I do think that there is um, a lot to be said for focusing on rebuilding the country and having like a domestic works program, um, not only from a um, capital, you know, projects perspective, but also from a putting people to work perspective. Um, there's still so many people who are out of work or underemployed, but there's so much work to be done. And, you know, a lot of folks like to point to the skills gap, but in my opinion, it's not really a skills gap issue. It's just that we're not matching the work that needs to be done uh, and and valuing it in the way that we should. So seeing some sort of focus at the federal level on, on employing people to do the work of rebuilding the country would be wonderful. And I think that would help, especially coming back from this pandemic and this uh, recession, possible depression, I think it would help us get out of it, have, have a quicker recovery. Um, at the state level, there's, you know, there's a ton of things that you could do in New Jersey. And one of the great things about going to Blousing was just, you know, understanding how deep you can go in one place, how, how much you can learn about policy and government in one state. Um, and, I, you know, everybody has their bugaboo uh, when it comes to New Jersey politics and policy beyond some, you know, some of the major things that uh, I and my colleagues have said around having a more equitable tax code and one that raises revenue in a more reliable and consistent manner so we can actually afford the things that we need to invest in. You know, that, that's just, I got I to gotta be a broken record on that. Um, but other than that, um, we, we really do need to do a better job of actually putting our money where our mouth is on our complaints. We complain all the time about there being too many municipalities, but then don't really come up with a real legitimate plan for making that happen. And I think there are ways you could do that. You could do things through DCA. Uh, you could have a program in place to incentivize you know, localities to uh, consolidate. Uh, but that's going to take real work and that's going to take investment. That's just not going to happen overnight with the, with what we have. Um, so I would like to see that. I would like to see a recommitment to um, funding and expanding NJ Transit. It's been so long since we've had a conversation about transportation in this state. That wasn't just how do we get back to a reliable operation. You know, if we were having a real conversation, we'd be talking about what are the parts of the state that need access and that should be having their own train stations. And, you know, we're not at that point, but we need to get to that point. I think uh, talking about investment in NJ Transit and not just rail, but also bus is going to would be really great to see. Uh, but finally, the, the, the real number one thing I think is um, I, I really think in New Jersey, the major challenge facing us, and I think this is almost a really good dry run for what we're going to face in the long term, is we're a coastal state. Right. We do not take climate change and the threat of climate change as seriously as we should. And there's been some studies recently done about if sea level rise is as bad as we expect it to be, you could have uh, you know a real crisis in property tax in New Jersey. And for a state that relies on property tax as much as we do, uh, that's something that should be you know DEFCON one, you know all hands on tech, everybody trying right. to figure this out. Um, so if we think that coronavirus is messing with our economy, we don't want to see what the climate change impacts are going to do to us as, you know, considering our location. And so uh, for me, I, I hope that there is more focus on those issues because for the long term health and wellness and welfare of the state of New Jersey, uh, we, we have to figure out solutions to those problems. Otherwise, uh, we're going to have a lot bigger issues facing us that we're not going to be able to address and we're not going to be able to keep our residents and our communities whole. Well, for, for better or for worse, you've given us a lot of topics we could bring you back on to talk about on another love to. another edition of the podcast there. Yeah. Um, certainly climate change is, is something we'd like to like to hear a lot more about and talk a lot more about. Thanks for coming on today, Brandon. This was really, uh, really wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I hope to come back soon. Uh, another thanks to our production team, Tamara Swedberg, Amy Cobb, and Karen Olson. We'll be back next week with another talk from another expert from the Blaustein School. Stay safe out there. Thanks.